do you think in a world where we're obsessed with selfies, social media, those kind of things, do you think it's that lack of inspiration at night is causing us perhaps not to think big enough or even think about our place in the universe? That's a great question because most people today live in cities. Yeah. I, I remember, well, I, I can only speak for the United States, but it may be similar around the world. There was a day when the, the census takers reported that more people are living in cities than not in cities, so that there's been a slow accumulation of the mass of humanity living on top of one another in cities. And in cities, there's light. And when I grew up, there was also air pollution in New York City, so you have no relationship with the night sky. Yeah. And <clears throat> for me, I, uh, how, how did I li grow up in New York City and then come to embrace the universe? It required a planetarium. Yeah. So my local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium. And any good city is going to have a planetarium where they do turn out all the lights and you portray the stars on a, on a, on a dome, the inside surface of a dome. And so for me, I had not seen the night sky until I was nine. And I, I thought it was a hoax. Yeah. It was like, no, that's not real. That's not real. You guys are lying. It's a fun hoax. I enjoy. This is keep talking, but that's not real because I know what the night sky looks like. Yeah. I've seen it from the Bronx yeah. in New York, where I grew up, and it's got a dozen stars, <laughs> yeah. not countless thousands. Because if you do focus the light, then you could sort of run away to the countryside and put distance between you and the light and taken some of the night sky. But in Australia, I think you have no excuse. There ought to be a high-speed rail from the cities, all your major cities, Perth, Canberra, even Darwin, mm -hmm. have a rail going straight to the center and deposit people there a couple of days a month mm -hmm. and just to look up. Mm -hmm. that sh it should be like the cosmic train. So do you think then, do you think then it is affecting the way that we think or about ourselves? That was your question. I'm yeah. sorry I got all carried away. Uh, I think it, it subtracts from your life experience. Yeah. It prevents you from understanding that we are part of a larger universe and that there are, there are forces operating. For example, what will it take for me to convince you that there are asteroids out there that could come strike Earth and render us extinct. Yes, I can show you dinosaur bones at the museum, but that's just kind of a historical thing. You know, that happened then, it's not gonna happen now. Then I tell people, well, no, there's asteroids out there with our name on it, Earth is branded on it, and the day can arise where we go extinct just the way the dinosaurs went extinct. And pick your favorite scurrying creature who would then replace us in the niche pride open by our absence. Yeah. And so, yes, I think it creates a greater challenge for the educator to connect you to the cosmos. But I don't think it's impossible. I think it's still very doable. I think people are starved for it and they don't even know it. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely agree. While we're thinking big, um, the Kepler space mission, Kepler space telescope, in a relatively short amount of time it's found over a thousand exoplanets and of those thousand planets only a small portion of those have similar properties to Earth's. Now if we could... Just to be clear, <clears throat> the, the telescope was conceived and designed to find Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. Mm -hmm. so, so the small subset that we think of now in the, in, in the latest news reports as being just like Earth are said of them because they're not only about the same size as Earth, as so many of them are, mm. but they're also orbiting at the right distance yes. to sustain liquid water. The habitable zone. And the habitable zone. I call it the Goldilocks yeah. zone, yeah. the just right temperature. So, so, so they'll have that, and they're closer in, in mass to the Earth, and the orbital time is about the same. Yeah. And this creates a certain, a certain um, a deeper curiosity for what could be going on there, mm. simply because of how many boxes are checked for their similarity to Earth. But in general, most of those exoplanets have some properties similar to that of Earth. It's this subset that have essentially all properties. What if one of those planets, I imagine through spectroscopy, one of those planets we could tell 
that the emissions in the atmosphere, uh, we, we, we could tell that there was an intelligent species on one of those planets. Well, so it's a great question. And it's, so the way one would go about that is you would ask, if you, uh, if you are operating on the surface of a planet in one way or another, would you have an impact of some kind, some influence on the chemistry of the atmosphere? Yeah. Because you can measure the chemistry of an atmosphere from great distances. Mm -hmm. That'll be the first, with telescopes aren't good enough to go look at cities or anything going on. You can't do that, all right? Uh, not yet. But between now and when such a day arises, you analyze the atmosphere. And I can tell you a few things. If we find oxygen, we know chemically that oxygen is so highly reactive that you can't possibly have a planet that has oxygen without something constantly generating it. If you removed all plants from this earth, the oxygen would slowly but eventually go away entirely. Yeah. They make the oxygen. They're sustaining the oxygen. Mm -hmm. Other things are using the oxygen. Uh, you don't find an atmosphere of oxygen. And when I was a kid and I saw Star Trek, where they say, well, let's land on this planet. Well, let's beam down to the planet. It's an oxygen, nitrogen atmosphere. Yeah. And they'd go down and there's no life. No, you, you're not just looking for a planet that happens to have an oxygen atmosphere. Something is making it yeah. actively. So that would be an indication of life. Then, if you find things like um, smog or other sort of, uh, of po smog. pollutants, um, that would be the surest sign of the absence of intelligence in who is ever living there. <laughs> <laughs> like ourselves. I'm just saying. There we go. Um, now, what I would then ask also is, Given those great distances, how could we ever even contact those? Could we ever have a means of meaningful contact with those, those species? Not in any foreseeable future, no. So just forget about it. Because, you know, yeah, forget about it and go on to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> because it's the speed of light. No, yeah, yeah. Light. Even at the speed of light, the time for these signals to get there rivals that of the life expectancy of, the, of a human organism. Yeah. So uh, if it's a star 100 light years away and you send a signal today, it gets there in 100 years, then they have to not only be what we would think of as intelligent, but they also have to have technology. Mm -hmm. The Romans were intelligent, but they didn't have radio telescopes mm -hmm. in ancient Rome. So you need technology sufficient to detect the signal, figure out the signal, and send a signal back at the speed of light. Radio waves travel at the speed of light. So, that's another hundred years back. You are long dead. So there is no witty repartee mm -hmm. possible in any known understanding of the structure and fabric of the universe. We need wormholes and warp drives and all the things that are common in science fiction. We have, we're nowhere close to that at all mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about time. Is I don't mean to disappoint everybody, I'm just saying. Now, here's, an here's another thing I want to ask. Just get over it, okay? <laughs> talking, about, talking about time. What is time? I struggle to even think about a way in which I can articulate what time is. We know we're so familiar with it. We use it every day. I mean, we've arranged this meeting here because it's a location plus time. But how do we actually define it? And it can't, it, without it, we can't evolve because one moment must obviously lead to the next in order to let things happen. But then how do we actually define So you've had this angst this existential angst for some time, well, clearly. Well, it's getting to me. I mean, I want to, I want to be able to tell okay. you. We have 12-step programs for people who oh. are disturbed by that. So, so time, uh, one of my favorite uh, accountings of time, it was either by Einstein or his student, John Wheeler. I'd, uh, John Wheeler coined the term black hole, and John Archibald Wheeler, a famous physicist yeah. from uh, some decades ago, and mid 20th century and, and thereafter. He, uh, I took a class from him. In fact, a class on relativity, wow. where I met my wife, by the way. She, she has a PhD yeah, in right. mathematical physics. We met in graduate school in a relativity class <laughs> taught by John Archibald Wheeler. But one of the famous quotes is, um, time is defined to make motion look simple. Okay. 
because you cannot describe motion without some reference to time. Right. And so you define it so that motion is something we can describe easily with equations and things. So that's kind of a cop-out answer, but it's a very uh, functional answer for the physicist. Yeah. Um, I also think of time as this prison. Uh, time makes us all a prisoner of the present, forever transitioning from our own past into an unknown future. Mm. And uh, that's particularly uh, disturbing to me because we can move back and forth in any other coordinate, mm. you know, up and down, left and right, forward and back, but we're stuck in time. Mm. We can't move forward or backwards in time arbitrarily. Mm. So that coordinate has a kind of a fundamental difference from the other three. Now, my, uh, my professional ancestors, the earliest astronomers, basically invented timekeeping. All right. So all measures of time historically were derived from cosmic rhythms. So what we today we would say the rotation of the Earth, but in the day it was the movement of the sun. Yeah. So that gave you a day, and then the sun's position on the sky throughout the days differed, and temperatures changed. So that gave us the seasons, and then of course back then it was the sun doing all this, but we would learn that we rotate and we revolve around the sun. So. That took really long to figure out, disturbingly long. I mean, only like 400 years ago when, so what it tells you is that you can keep track of time even though you have no freaking idea <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> because all that matters to you is that things repeat. Yeah. If you have something that repeats predictably, right. you, then you have created a timekeeping mechanism. If I could ask you, if there was one thing you wanted people to remember that you could say, about science, what would that be? That the universe is knowable. And what one need not appeal to mystical, magical forces to account for things. Even if a day arises where something unfolds in front of your eyes that you cannot explain, just because you cannot explain it does not mean it is being driven by mystical, magical forces. It just means it's being driven by laws of physics that we know and you have yet to learn, or that we have all yet to discover. But the universe is knowable, and that's an amazing thing. It's knowable by our feeble human brain that rose up out of the, you know, the, the Serengeti, the, the plains of Africa, to rise up just to survive, to not get eaten, and we build a civilization where we have sufficient free time so that we can contemplate our place in the universe.